This has all happened before. When your world started to end. Long ago, your land was plagued by the Red Death. Corpses lined the streets, and so your people left in exodus, abandoning everything when the world started to end. Your kind desperately followed King Arthur to set sail for our island of Avalon, where he mercilessly slaughtered us with unholy Excalibur and tainted grail in hand. A grave sin was committed, the cycle of life and death broken. You built Meniers to sustain your presence. Now those Meniers go dark, and the king is long gone. This island was not meant for humans. Hey look, it's Tainted Grail, edgy dark fantasy. It's King Arthur Roundtable Dark Souls edition. No, oh, like seriously, look, look at this box art. You cannot tell me that this is not a bonfire. But no, this game isn't Dark Souls. Tainted Grail is a dark fantasy exploration adventure game. Just like Dark Souls. Tainted Grail is set on the island of Avalon, a place that King Arthur and his knights conquered hundreds of years ago because hell yeah, imperialism, but also because they were running from a disease in their homeland called the Red Death. However, Arthur and his knights didn't like the natives, the Four Dwellers, because they're tall and weird and have four arms. So he did a casual genocide and erected these creepy Meneer statues everywhere to celebrate the occasion. Also, I'm being completely serious when the game calls the Four Dwellers weird, except it's spelled W-Y-R-D, and the weirdness is this ever-present force of nature in the game, represented by a dense fog that's creeping all over Avalon. Weirdness is in fact weird, because going in it makes everything weird. Reality starts warping, you're probably gonna go insane, and have your body turn inside out while growing extra appendages. Also, the Meneers are going dark, so it's up to you to go around lighting them all like these big giant bonfires to stave off weirdness and explore Avalon so you can uncover why all of this is happening. Also, also, your characters are second-rate heroes, because your hometown already sent off their best champions when Avalon's Meneers first started going dark. And they didn't come back, so now your characters are freaking the hell out, because now your town's Meneer is going dark. The rest of Avalon is probably already plunged into weirdness, and it's up to you, the dumbass, to go out and save the day? God, I love Tainted Souls' premise. Tainted Grail's premise. Look, Dark Souls' whole thing is that the bonfires are fading, and the world's falling into this hollow darkness, okay? Meneers, they're bonfires. Weirdness is darkness. Moving on. Tainted Grail's base campaign, The Fall of Avalon, has 15 chapters in it, each chapter taking two to three hours for a 40 hour long campaign. On a turn, you spend energy in order to perform actions such as moving around and exploring your current location. These are by far your two most common actions, since the meat of this game is the story. And how do you interact with the story? You move around and explore location cards. And exploring causes you to open this exploration journal and flip to the section with a number that matches the place you're exploring. The exploration journal is structured like a choose-your-own-adventure book and gives you branching paths for your exploration. Just look at the options, pick what you want, and get directed to a different verse to see the result. Pretty much anything can contextually happen, like, ooh, finding food, or ooh, you found money from treasure! Or sometimes you just take damage from falling in a hole while you're exploring. Or maybe you fell into a hole that led to a cave, and that cave had a bear, and he's mad. Once everyone's done spending energy, you pass it around and do a bunch of upkeep before repeating this round cycle. Upkeep includes stuff like eating food to heal, restoring energy, ticking down Meneer dials and or removing them if the dial runs out, drawing a new event card, yada yada, you get the gist, upkeep. 
You also pick a character for the campaign, each with six different attribute values, which are kind of like Dungeons and Dragons attributes in that they matter in just about everything, like combat, diplomacy, exploration, etc. Speaking of combat and diplomacy, each character not only starts with different combat and diplomacy encounter decks, but also have different deck upgrade pools. Characters also have different max health, energy, and mental health, plus they got a unique personal action and drawback. So that's Tainted Ground in a nutshell. Obviously there's a ton of nuance in the rules, but this ain't Watch It Play. So let's get on with the review. And don't worry, everything in this review is spoiler free when it comes to story events, secrets, and exploration. But we will occasionally showcase non-story stuff, like random encounters or items, as examples. Starting with the pros, Tainted Grill comes out swinging with this gorgeous aesthetic that just screams, I am a beautiful dark fantasy game. Location cards, encounter cards, combat and diplomacy cards, those cool sketches in the exploration journal and rule book, all the minis, the back of chapter event cards. I'm told that production wise it's annoying to produce so many different card backs with all these different chapter art pieces and chapter sections, so huge props for that. On top of that, flavor text and descriptive entries are plentiful in Tainted Grail. Events, secrets, encounters, you name it, there's plenty of those open-ended mysterious sentences that you read and go like, ooh. Avalon itself is also a really cool world. That starting hook with Arthur coming in and slaughtering all the four dwellers while driving back all this misty weirdness is really gripping. It makes you want to go out and explore to learn more about the four dwellers, what Arthur and the Round Table of Knights were like and what the weirdness and Meneers even are. Before you set out though, everyone gets these badass world maps made by cartographers of old, meaning that they're actually slightly inaccurate, which is an insanely cool detail when you're going out and exploring trying to figure out where everything is. And while you're trekking across Avalon, every location card can be explored, and all of them tell a story about the locale that really helps to make all of Avalon feel more alive, or feel more dead and weird. As the campaign progresses, you absolutely will unravel this mystery piece by piece. And during the journey, it's so fun to speculate as to what the hell is even happening. The overall presentation of Tenet Grail is incredibly strong, and the entire game's components come together to make this super engrossing package that just makes you want to dive in and just see what's around every corner, what all the terrible, horrible monsters look like, and why Avalon is the way that it is. You want to get your imagination going and get sucked into Tainted Grail's dark fantasy world? These components and their aesthetic absolutely facilitate that. Also, shout out to the creative liberties given to the monster and world designs in general. The weirdness is such a good excuse to have monsters look particularly monstrous and deformed, as well as create environments that are totally surreal. Tainted Grail includes an excellent insert that very neatly stores everything and even leaves some space to spare. There's four slots for each of the four characters, perfectly molded spaces for all the minis, spaces for all the standard size cards, terra size cards, and European mini size cards. Despite having this grandiose epic campaign presentation, Tainted Grail is actually pretty easy to tear down and set up. Player boards are hugely chunky and feel very satisfying to put these general marker cubes and health trackers into. It's one of those things that wasn't necessary at all, but super nice that's there. Especially because there's no way in hell you're ever going to accidentally move your health and attributes around and forget what they were. Also, it's clever how every character board has two halves, with one half detachable to show abilities and the other side to show backstory and setup, so that when you're setting up your character for the first time, you aren't constantly flipping over the actual board and dumping your cubes all over the table. I should also mention that these cubes are used as universal markers for pretty much everything in the game, and they give you a lot of them. It's a pretty nice system for keeping track of stuff without bogging the game down with a million unique tokens. Also, random little tidbit, but the veneers are so satisfying to tick down. Like, listening to your Doomsday Clock countdown is just pure ASMR, just listen. Also, also, they threw in a Witcher as an encounter, and called him a Beast Slayer. That is amazing. Anyways, with all this praise about the components, what about actually, you know, using them to play a tabletop board game called Tainted Grail, Fall of Avalon? Well, to start, the learning experience has a lot going for it, like this open and play guide. I'll walk you through an example round as a single player. I, I didn't actually use this. But I actually did, and it's pretty cool how it'll get you playing the game in minutes for such a big game. We'll get back to this though.
And for the actual rulebook, it's very well organized on top of being very visually pleasing with all the pictures everywhere. There's also a table of contents and an index in the back, making it easy to jump to whatever aspect of the game you need rulings on. And right before it talks about combat, there's even a brief section on general game tips that are really good to start you off. But if you need better, more specific survival tips, Awakened Realms posted a survival guide on Board Game Geek. Still, kind of wish those BGD tips made their way into the rulebook, but they were posted a few months after the game first launched, so I digress. These player aid cards are also nice and big, plus they're organized in such a way that you don't need to be constantly flipping them over all the time. This side is roundup keep, other side is your actions, this side is combat and diplomacy icons, other side is overworld and leveling info. You're only ever going to be referring to the entirety of one side depending on if you're exploring or fighting. On top of all this, Tainted Grail sets expectations very well for how general storytelling is going to play out. Between a tutorial and first chapter, you quickly learn as a player, oh, I literally just need to wander around and explore stuff to make things happen. And so you naturally adopt the groove of explore place, learn thing, make guess about chapter objective, move to next place, repeat. It's a very natural rhythm that feels satisfying to mull over as you're deciding where you need to go and what exactly you're looking for, especially once it all comes together and you have a clear path towards completing the chapter. Now let's talk about the actual gameplay mechanisms, starting with combat and diplomacy. Combat and diplomacy encounters come from these four decks. And during your travels and explorations, sometimes you'll be directed to draw from one of them. Green, purple, and gray encounters are all combat based, with green being wild animals, purple being magical weird stuff, and gray being other humans. Blue is also other humans, but it's all diplomacy encounters because sometimes you talk to humans instead of fighting them. Wow, gee. So here's how combat works. The encounter you draw goes face up somewhere with a bunch of space to the right. Then all players who happen to be involved shuffle their combat deck and draw three cards. Combat and diplomacy is always this back and forth where one player plays cards, then the encounter does something, then the next player plays cards, then back to the enemy, and after all players have went once, everyone draws another card from their deck, rinse and repeat. When you play cards, you're trying to join these attribute keys together, and if your player has the stats, so like, say this hammer beak has these keys, you have these stats, and you played surprise attack. This top bit didn't connect, so nothing happens. This double icon connection would activate since you have two of it, and it would fail if you only had one. But this last one, you don't have that stat, so it does nothing despite connecting. The blue connection isn't an attribute check, you instead can choose to activate it by paying one magic, and the bottom connection doesn't check for anything. If you connect down there, you just get it. Usually these connections just do damage, represented by this cube icon. You put the cubes to the left of the card. The enemy's health is up here. Do enough cube damage, and boom, you win, get rewards and loot. But be warned though, whenever it's the enemy's turn, their response is based on how much damage you've done to them, so you don't always want to just dump as much damage as you can right off the bat. Diplomacy is exactly the same as combat, but instead the attribute keys check for the stats on the right of your board, and instead of health, there's this track on a diplomacy card that you put a cube on and you win by ticking the cube to the top with these up arrows. Same deal, player plays stuff. Cube go up, enemy responds, it probably goes down. Draw once everyone's gone, you get the gist. This card system is really unique, like we haven't seen this weird attribute checking key matching system anywhere else. It's honestly a pretty cool puzzle to learn at first when you're trying to carefully sequence your cards to not only do damage, but also trigger the enemy response you want, end on good setup keys for the next card, or even end with cool effects like drawing extra cards or reducing enemy attacks. On top of that, after the encounter's over, it's pretty cool being able to look at the whole sequence of cards and see the story it tells. Sometimes it's an epic back and forth where you alternate between defending and attacking to whittle down a monster successfully. And other times you carefully plan out your approach and reposition into a devastating final blow. Just to kill a rabbit for dinner. Or you lie a bunch to an orphan and then tell him he needs Jesus. Okay, you know what? Most of the time the encounter stories are hilarious more often than not. Like, what? How does this even happen? Now is probably a good time to talk about health, considering that fighting is a pretty easy way to take damage. Tainted Grail does this super thematic thing where the lower your health, the more it limits your energy, while also making the threshold for incurring negative mental health conditions smaller. You really want to be careful about deciding to tank hits too often, because you absolutely do not want to be spending too much time with low health. 
because near fatal mistakes can end up death spiraling you anyways. Like if you don't have enough energy to move somewhere with food that you desperately need to get so that you can heal. But enough about thematically dying from wounds and starvation because your character is badass. There's no way in hell they're gonna succumb to something as trivial as a mortal wound. <laughs> Not with the power of skills and deck upgrades. So yeah, you're gonna constantly be accruing EXP from explorations and harder encounters and you can spend that EXP to permanently get a cube and an attribute. And once you get both cubes for an attribute, leveling it again instead lets you choose a skill card for that attribute and keep it next to your board, granting you very useful abilities that can do everything from making combat easier to passively generating resources. You can also choose to spend EXP to draw three cards from either the combat or diplomacy advancement pool for your character, and then pick one of those cards to replace a card from your deck. So yeah, the progression is pretty satisfying, and you can definitely build your characters in ways that can greatly alleviate different threats from the game, with quite a wide variety of build paths and trains of thought for what upgrades you want to take first. Struggling with combat? Spend that EXP on a few combat cards and get some aggression skills to draw extra cards. Hate scavenging for food? Well, hunger resistant almost lets you ignore food as a mechanic. Meneers are annoying to constantly light? Elbow grease. Spend energy instead of magic because you're so ripped you punch Meneers to light them. There's also an additional layer of specialization to consider when leveling because your attributes that share a row, so like aggression and empathy or courage and caution, also share ever increasing EXP costs. Basically, the more you level an attribute, the more EXP it's gonna cost next time. But like I said, it's shared for rows. So a ton of aggression will make leveling empathy very expensive. Between these opposing attributes and health affecting energy and mental, I just love the amount of thought that's put into making the mechanics thematic. But enough about the mechanics, let's talk about the story, which I consider to be Tainted Grail's greatest strength over everything else in the game. Currently, I'm in the middle of chapter six and I'm constantly on the edge of my seat wanting to know the next secret about Avalon. I've already learned a great deal about King Arthur and the Tainted Grail and I feel like I'm just on the cusp of another big reveal but instead I have to make this goddamn review instead of buying more. Ah! I can't stress enough just how enjoyable the mystery of Avalon is. If you like a good dark fantasy mystery premise and think Tainted Grail's vibes are cool as hell, chances are this exploration journal is going to be absolutely gripping for you. Of course, I haven't made it to the end, so if my questions don't get answered or something in the story turns out to be really stupid, I can't speak on that. But so far, I'm hooked. I've always been hooked since the beginning and I want to know what happens next. There's just so much wonder and intrigue behind Avalon as you're steadily being fed lore from your travels and explorations. Tainted Grail is great at getting you thinking about what's happening and why, with excellent usage of contextual hints like certain tidbits of information characters drop or strange environmental details. Very often, you're let in on these minor details that slowly but surely affirm your suspicions about how the weirdness works and what exactly Arthur did to conquer Avalon. I know it's really hard to talk specifics about this without any spoilers, so here's a really vague example I just made up. Imagine a conversation and you ask about info for something. Then they answer a question like, that's a weird thing to ask me, didn't so and so happen like this? And you're like, what? Okay, sure. But then later on, you walk past a monument that reminds you of what that person said. And there's something weird about the monument, so you realize, wait, they said that, but that would mean if they saw what they saw, but I'm here seeing this right now. On top of that, I wanna point out that there's multiple paths you can take in this story. Like right off the bat, there's different ways you can choose to leave your hometown and then different main objectives to choose from on some of the chapter event cards. It's pretty cool just how much freedom Tainted Grail gives the player to just randomly roam about and do stuff all without breaking story structure. Aside from the exploration journal blocking off certain passages unless you're in a specific chapter, there's also the clever use of statuses and secret cards. These are the other two ways that the story tracks what you've done so far, as sometimes the journal will have a new option. Say like, if you have secret 69 giggity, do this option instead. Or it can block you off. Like if you have the pissed in the well status, the villagers refuse to talk to you. 
This is how the game makes you stuck with your decisions for the entire campaign, as some statuses get checked for more often than others. It makes you wonder, damn, how would this game have played out if I had chosen not to pee in that village well? What sort of dialogue options would have been open? What different allies or enemies would I have gained had I just not peed in the well? And in the case of statuses, they're vague enough that they can clue you in on the significance of certain locations or future things that you can potentially do without explicitly saying anything about them. Which goes hand in hand with how Tainted Grail is constantly planting ideas in your head and have you hypothesize about Avalon with every new detail gleaned. In short, Tainted Grail vibes hard and looks good, but now it's time for the cons and uh... Holy shit, where do I even start with this? The strands of this game fall apart and then constantly intersect with each other to make this tangled mess of compounding issues that literally applies the you are going insane card to me in real life because there's just so many things that make me lose my goddamn mind. This rule book has some issues. Remember how I said in the pros that it was well organized? That's true, but it has a common issue of going to a section you need and then not finding the answer you need. There's so many rulings that are described too vaguely, mixed in with rulings that have too much unnecessary explanations that I'm just gonna start firing off a whole bunch of confusing nonsense. So at the start of a round, everything that has a time down in the game has to tick down because some stuff is temporary. Everything that has a time down removes the style once it's run out, which then causes something to happen, like that thing being removed from the board or spawning something in, whatever. Meneers break this rule for no goddamn reason and stay around for one more round even after removing the dial, which at first seemed like, okay, that's confusing, whatever. But this actually matters later on, especially for the drain skills and power transfer. Like, can you swap a Meneer dial with a Meneer that doesn't have a dial? If so, then power transfer is an excellent skill. But then by that logic, as long as the Meneer on the board, it's treated as having a dial even without one. So then, can you drain a Meneer without a dial? What about Guardians, which are wandering monsters that at the start of the round, you roll a die to see where they move. If there's multiple Guardians, what order do you roll the die for each one? Or maybe you just roll one die for all of them. But then, what order do they resolve? The rulebook literally doesn't mention this, yet it does mention what happens if you walk onto a space with multiple Guardians in it, which, like, never happens. What the f- Here's a bunch of combat and diplomacy related questions. If you have multiple players fighting the same monster, are you allowed to show each other your hands? Hey, you see this weird triple oval symbol on diplomacy cards? If you successfully connect it, you refer to the encounter card to see what it does. Up arrow is obvious, but what about attribute with up arrow? Does that mean it goes up if connected in that attribute, or up if your character has that attribute? Probably the former, because the latter is too easy, but diplomacy in general is kind of too easy, so I don't even- This icon means on placement. Resolve the effect after placing this card into the sequence. Does that mean right after you place the card, or right after resolving all the connection keys first? The rulebook seems to mean after all the keys. So then, why don't they call it after placement instead of on placement, and change the sentence to say resolve this ability after resolving the card's keys. Thankfully, a lot of these questions are answered in the unofficial FAQ on BGG, which, funnily enough, is actually mentioned in the official Tainted Grail FAQ, which, might I add, is so much worse than the unofficial one because the official FAQ is insanely short and mostly answers questions that are already answered by the rulebook. Then again, I don't really blame people for asking these questions because the rulebook is definitely pretty whack with its explanations. But hey, these are all just dumb nuances, right? Didn't we say it's really easy to just jump in and start playing back in the pros? Well, sure, but Tainted Grail is really bad at explaining intricacies and doesn't really cover edge cases, which you would think would be the point of the rulebook since there's a learn to play guide, which... Which is hand-holding on your single short adventure where it tells you exactly what to do. But it doesn't really explain why you're doing these things. This is the worst for combat and diplomacy, where it packages these decks in a very specific way so you draw cards, and it tells you exactly what to play, and it does damage. But cool, why are you playing these cards? It should have given a quick rundown on what combat and diplomacy actually are like, and some core basic fundamentals of them before throwing you in and telling you exactly what to do, because this says start here, so you'd read this before you read the actual rulebook, right? In my first few hours playing this game, I always had this nagging feeling that I was playing it incorrectly, and it never really went away until I shifted my mindset to just say, fuck it, just play the game and make stuff up. If you're someone who really likes to play board games exactly by rules as written, so you feel assured you are playing as the designers intended, you're gonna get annoyed here. 
The rulebook in general also just loves to waste your time and was pretty tedious to read through front to back. Very often there are parentheses that say like, see location, without even telling you the page number, so you have to turn to the index in the back. There's also a ton of redundancy, the travel section says see location twice in the same section on travel. Also, do you really need to explain the layout of a quest card to me? Like, I can just read the quest card itself and see, oh yeah, this is a title, that part is flavor text. Oh, that's the objective. Oh, that part clearly says quest. Oh wow, the hint says it's a hint. Oh boy. There's even an example in the diplomacy bonuses section that I was looking at trying to answer my question about that weird triple oval symbol that made me dig through the encounter deck looking not for a specific card name, but rather a specific encounter option on a card called reveal a forgery. And the example still didn't even answer my question. Are you fucking kidding me? The only forgery I revealed is this godforsaken rulebook that was clearly never meant for humans because it's plagued by weirdness. Oh yeah, also the URL in the rulebook for tainedgrow.com slash learn doesn't even work, so that's cool. Also, there's a really random rule for settling turn player ordering disputes where it says to use the character number order starting with one. Wait, character number? What even is that? It's actually the number that's on your character's backstory letter. Okay, first, why do you even need a rule for this? And second, why would they not just put this number on the character board next to their name? Or like the back of the flip out if they want it out of the way. You literally read your letter once and then put it away. Like that's some real dysfunctional component usage. Okay, enough with the rule book. There's other dysfunctional component usage that I want to complain about starting with the overworld for the game, which you're gonna be looking at all the time because you know, it's the map you're moving your minis around on. First of all, these Meneers, which are really cool to look at, get annoying fairly quickly. They're huge and have a tendency to just block information, not only on the card that they're on, but also cards behind them. Did you even see this guy? Didn't think so. Okay, you can just pick them up, right? But you have to be careful doing so because you don't want to accidentally yeet the time dial inside them because it's decently loose with a lot of empty space above the dial. Also, these time dials are super gimmicky and hard to see unless you paint the numbers brighter. And on top of that, the game frequently asks you to slot a time token into these time dials to track passage of time for certain things. But it's really loose, so it's really easy for the token to just shift randomly between numbers. But back to Meneers, you quickly learn to just always put the Meneer dead center of cards where it never covers up anything important except, you know, the amazing artwork I want to see. Also, in exploring locations, you have the option to flip over the card to look at some really cool art and the initial exploration text. But you quickly stop doing this because it's really annoying always having to take minis and meneers off the card. So instead, you solely stick with the journal for exploration text. But the journal usually lacks the beautiful full art you see on the card back. So that sucks. I would have much rather that the backs didn't even have any text and just let the art speak for itself, because at the moment, the text is just redundant since you have to use the journal regardless once you start making choices. And while I'm being idealistic, I don't like how the map is made of cards and would much rather have it made of tiles. Again, the art on these cards is beautiful, and it's really cool to connect them together and see the map just become whole. But because they are cards, they shift around all the time and make the overworld feel jank, which is a really cheap feeling in a game that I would otherwise commend for being extremely high quality with its components and presentation. Okay, there's definitely not enough space in the box for tiles, but I mean, when you look at the original Kickstarter promotional images, the box looks way bigger, so that would have done it. Or just not having these big Meneer minis that take up so much space in the insert. Like, Ah, they look so cool, but in practice, I just find them kind of dysfunctional in actual gameplay. Seriously though, when you don't account for all the minis in the box, look at what Tainted Grail is as a game. It's literally just a small number of decks, the exploration journal, and the stuff for tracking like markers and papers. And that's my segue to start complaining about these other components. So when you pick a character and get your combat and diplomacy decks, you're supposed to dig out your basic cards, which have a number from 1 out of 25, as well as the initial of your color. So U is blue, what the fuck? B is brown, Y is gray, G is green. That's not confusing at all. Then get your character cards numbered 1 through 15. 
Your starting two decks for combat and diplomacy are the basic cards 1 through 15 that have this small banner underneath the name. So match the color with your board and then shuffle 16 through 25 with your character specific 1 through 15 cards to create your advancement pool. There's so many different options that they could have done to improve clarity problems here. Like basic 16 through 25 should really have just been another initial and say 1 through 10 or just not even exists and there'll just be 25 character cards for each character. Or even better, instead of this tiny banner that we didn't even notice at first, how about above the name, it just says basic or advanced. You know, like how the character cards have their names above them. Even more weird is that when you flip over to the detachable character pieces, they each clearly have their own unique color symbol here. Why the hell is this not just used? Speaking of colorblind shenanigans, the encounter decks have extremely similar card backs where the corners have different colors and positions. You're supposed to place them like this 2x2 two two position, but that just makes them annoying to draw from, so I always just line them up sideways like any good Yu-Gi-Oh! and or Magic player. I would have much rather have the visual design have different pictures on the backs like a green beast skull, some weird purple monster, and a blue human face instead of this uninspired corner thing they got currently and a bunch of skulls. Look, we're not saying you have to specifically cater to colorblind people, but we are arguing that clear symbology and iconography is stronger information parsing at a glance for everyone, and when done well, doesn't mess with colorblind people in the first place. Am I colorblind or something? No, but I do know a guy. And that's just a thing in general with Tainted Grail. It doesn't really have good information gathering at a glance because of so many things we mentioned, like the blocky manier minis and the subpart presentation of decks. This gets further compounded as you start progressing into mid-game and have a bunch of skills, items, secrets, and just dials everywhere. Now onto the save sheet, and while I think statuses were implemented well, this save sheet, not so much. First of all, the entire front page, aside from player notes, is basically useless because... WE HAVE TECHNOLOGY! So with the front page freed up, what do we use all that space for? Easy, just make this whole thing statuses, but leave enough space under the checkboxes to be able to write notes about where you got the status from. All the time, we later stumble onto a cool exploration that checks if we have a status and we're like, oh, oh my god, we do. Wait, where do we even get this from? Like, look how many statuses there are. You 100% have to take notes on this unless you have the most wrinkled brain on the planet. We also don't think that there's enough encounter variety because each deck only has 30 cards split into four tiers of difficulty, but tiers one and two make up the majorities of the decks and get removed from the game fairly early on as difficulty increases, leaving you with decks that are basically about 10 cards each. You are frequently forced to just randomly draw from these decks, so your encounters will quickly become really dry and repetitive, which Really doesn't help that feeling of grindiness you find a lot of complaints about online. Especially the blue diplomacy encounter deck, because a good chunk of it is made up of nothing happens cards. So the amount of actual encounters is lessened. Like how many fucking times am I gonna get framed? You'd think that after the third time that I was framed and proved my innocence, that people would chill. Especially if I'm sitting on like 30 reputation. But apparently, everyone's just like, Hey, that guy really did it this time, I swear! I also get robbed a lot, so at this point, I just like to think that there's just some dude out there who's failing to steal from me, and then constantly framing me for robbing myself. Okay, so I just alluded to a grind earlier, so let's start talking about bad gameplay mechanisms and balance. The grind in Tainted Grail is real. Like, I know it can be alleviated greatly through things like skills or just taking paths of lesser resistance, but the fact still remains that it's unavoidable and really just makes a mockery of itself at a certain point. You have to feed yourself every other turn at a minimum, and you always have to light souvenirs every now and then by just paying a bunch of resources depending on the location. And how do you get these resources? There's quite a bit of locations that make you fight an encounter just by walking through them. Plus, you also have to regularly be doing these special location actions for food that are usually found in forests that make you fight a random green encounter. Random encounters are by far your most consistent and efficient source of all five of your resources because explorations cost energy and can have all sorts of wacky, unpredictable outcomes. Meanwhile, if you're just trying to get from point A to B, it's optimal to trigger as many random encounters as possible along the way, assuming you're well equipped because it doesn't cost energy to fight. So, if you win unscathed or with minor damage, you're basically passively generating resources. 
It's like turning your travel actions into move and sometimes get some magic EXP and wealth, maybe take a damage or two. And with the small encounter decks we just pointed out, yeah, this gets repetitive and tedious pretty fast. Even more so because Tainted Grail has such a cool story and random encounters just, they just feel random. It feels like I'm going into my tractor and driving through Avalon just grinding up baddies. Except the tractor don't work too good because sometimes a stray limb flies up and hits me in the face for minor damage, but it's fine because I eat the limb because food heals you and I still get the rest of the farm loot. But wait, isn't Tainted Grail supposed to be this difficult, edgy survival game? I think it was intended to be? Like, from where I am in mid-chapter 6, I can fight the highest tier 4 encounters by myself and still win. Probably even with superficial wounds if I choose to spend consumable items. That leaves me really concerned because I feel like when I get to the point where tier 4s are supposed to be a regular occurrence, I'm going to be absolutely slaughtering them. And if the game is already feeling unchallenging and tedious, I can't imagine this gets any better later on in the campaign. Early on, when combat was new and exciting, it was actually a cool puzzle to work around, where fights would take longer and have this back and forth that made combat seem much more perilous. Then, once you get a handful of good combat card upgrades, a combat skill, and a weapon, combat instead becomes more about trying to figure out how to build the correct combo to kill enemies on the first turn. Basically, somewhere around chapter 4 or 5, I stopped feeling like the second-rate hero that the game describes your characters as, Instead, I felt like I was THE goddamn hero of just obliterating everything in my path. And once you get this powerful, the problem compounds on itself because if fighting gets easier, you're not going to fear quote-unquote dangerous fights, and so if you're casually slaughtering all the random bad guys that show up, you'll get showered in rewards and loot, which means getting even stronger. I mean, you don't have to fight everything, you could just walk around the locations that start random encounters and run away if you are forced into fights, but Running away causes you to take an opportunity attack from enemies, and healing is pretty slow in this game, so I might as well just take the fight and try to kill them before I get hit. It only takes like a minute to shelf my deck, draw my hand, and start doing some quick math to calculate how much damage I can do, right? I mean, I, I say this, but after God knows how many fights I've done, yeah, this gets really tedious. You could also just nerf yourself and avoid taking stronger skills and weapons, but one, that's stupid, there's a lot of strong abilities in this game, so where do you even draw the line? And two, with the frequency at which encounters are sprung at you, I'd hate for them to all take longer since you're not as powerful. Especially since at the moment, they're all random and meaningless. Which leads me to what I think should be the solution. Substantially less encounters, and little to no random ones at that. Our most memorable fights have always been the times when we were exploring and we contextually end up fighting a specific monster. Now, there's suddenly weight and meaning behind the encounter. Instead of just walking into town and getting framed again, can you guys fucking stop? We wholeheartedly believe that the rate of getting resources should be much more infrequent, but when you do get resources, you get a big stockpile all at once that you have to plan out how you're gonna ration. Because at the moment, survival doesn't feel tense. It just feels annoying. Like every so often you're going grocery shopping at the forest farmer's market and spending the whole day there just grinding food instead of progressing the story. Like if I kill a goddamn chunky bear, why does it give me the same amount of food as this dumbass rabbit? Google tells me killing a deer can give you multiple weeks worth of food. So this royal elk? Why doesn't it give me like 10 food or something? What the f- But back to the point, imagine that instead of spamming the location action it just randomly throws green encounters at you, you instead get clued in from a village you stop by where they talk about how some of them have seen this bear randomly come by and kill their livestock. So you go to explore the forest, and you have some idea of what tracks you can follow that lead you to the bear. You kill the bear, get a crap ton of food, but then in the process, learn about how the bear went off into the weirdness because the weirdness was disrupting its normal hunting grounds. So then, you check out the bear's usual hunting grounds and discover some strange relic of the past that gives you some slight historical hints about Arthur and his knights doing some weird <laughs> about how they like <laughs> area. And also, if fights are just less frequent, that's a better excuse to make their average difficulty much harder. Back in the pros, we mentioned how the combat Initially, it was like this pretty cool puzzle to learn and there was this actual back and forth during your fights. We really wish fights felt like that more often, and if the fights are narratively set up properly, we wouldn't mind if every fight took that long, because story-wise, we're invested, and mechanically, it's more engaging for the difficulty. Of course, this would make downtime even worse, because as it currently stands, if someone is off fighting by themselves, the rest of the group kind of just have to wait for them to finish. 
But if the whole game is balanced around there being less fighting in general, you can balance monsters by player count instead of the tier difficulty rating. For instance, you could have different health values based on the player count so that you're encouraged to group up for your fights. I mean, obviously you'd have to change how monsters do their attacks, seeing as it's based on their current health, but honestly there's a lot of ways to addressing that, like adding more attack responses or jumping back to the top if you go past the last health threshold. It's still a worthwhile change though, because as it stands right now, once everyone is capable of soloing tier 3s and 4s, Tainted Grail doesn't really scale any more upward from there, so then why even group up? I mean, I Yes, they could have added in some legendary tier 5 and 6 enemies, but at that point you're playing with ridiculous numbers that really don't fit well into the game's combat constraints. Like one big problem is how you can never increase your maximum health because of how it's tied to your character board. So as a result, there's just certain damage numbers monsters will never be able to do because otherwise you'll just get instantly killed. Like for reference, that weird bear's most damaging attack is 4. And there's tier 4s where their most damaging attack is 5, so there really isn't a lot of range to play around with numbers. So yeah, that's our argument for lessening encounter frequency while simultaneously rebalancing them. The only form of random encounters we would keep are the Guardians, which are these monsters that spawn in and randomly wander around the map because at least these guys cause some interesting gameplay moments. At least they did, until we got strong enough to just turn them into walking pinatas. You also see them way less in single player because they frequently will show up from these chapter setup cards only if you have higher player counts, but that's like not a good way to balance difficulty considering how random they are. Sometimes they go straight at you, sometimes they just spend so long in one corner of the map that they just despawn because the Meneer there goes out, and other times they literally just despawn in the first turn. When I was playing solo, I'd straight up cheat and spawn them in anyways because like, come on, I want to use these minis! But yeah, I recall reading online how the minis add-on kind of is just useless, and I, I think I would have to agree. They're fairly underutilized, especially if they show up during random encounters, and you just kill them on the spot, so you don't even need to put the mini down. There really should have been more random events that can spawn them in. Then, there would also be room for some juicy flavor text on the card, instead of how chapter setup cards just go like, Duh, I don't know, just... Put a big bird on the map there, who cares? Actually, on that note, there should be more random event cards in general, because there's only 22 of them, and there's some duplicates, you know. Yeah, it really doesn't help the repetitiveness of encounters and grinding. Ultimately, the point I'm trying to get across here is that once you do enough of the gameplay loop, and the novelty of it just wears off, it turns into a slog. The combat, encounter variety, resource management, lighting veneers, those things are cool as hell when you're first playing. It felt tense. It felt unique. I felt like I was surviving. Now, I feel like I'm living some comfortable modern life, where my day job is grinding and when I get home from work, I can finally do what I want to do and progress the actual story. Like, that isn't a difficult, edgy, dark survival game. That's just tedious. Wasting time is not hard. But now that we've talked through this massive grinding con, it paves the way to explaining other aspects of the game that intersect with the problem. For one, I don't think that random encounters should ever be able to give you EXP. The fact that they can gives you a massive incentive to just fight everything and be on the grind constantly. Plus, there exists locations that let you infinitely just fight things, and there's also points in the story where the punishment for taking too long is minimal, so you're safe to just farm away. When first playing, you really don't think Tainted Grail is going to play like this because early on, EXP is slow, and you don't even see EXP on Tier 1 and 2 encounters. You end up thinking EXP and resources are going to be fairly unreliable early on, but nope, that's just because early encounters aren't that rewarding. You really don't get a good sense of how much you need to value what you have, especially reputation. Because, god, reputation is so useless later on. Like, I'm sitting on my 22 reputation with nothing to spend it on. Like, why? Why does no one acknowledge my heroics? Also, when you start getting too many resources, the cubes get more tedious and dysfunctional because these slots are perfect for holding only six cubes. Thankfully, there's purples that count as five. But if you have, like, three purples, the reds start overflowing. So for magic and reputation, the two resources I have a surplus of, I just use my phone to track them. Like, you'd think that having these cubes as universal counters for everything would work fine, especially since purple fives exist, but numbers get high enough that apparently not. 
I even use D20s for when monsters have too much health because it's faster than digging out a bunch of cubes and then clean them up over and over again. In fact, in the back of the Tainted Grail Weird rulebook, there's a challenge mode that mentions a 20 item cap for each resource, which does lead me to believe that, yes, it was intended that you can gather an insane stockpile of resources, but then there exists a special event that can suddenly just rip away those resources that you've accumulated? Like, God, I hate special events I. I'm not even gonna specifically say what happens, but let's just say if you have too many resources, it makes you discard down to a certain threshold, which is a super frustrating and inelegant way to counteract the game's own broken resource system. And speaking of challenge mode, I was thinking, well, if combat is too easy for me right now, maybe this would help? I haven't tried challenge mode, but upon reading over it, there's no way in hell I'm ever gonna implement these rules because all it does is make the game even more grindy. Like, most notably to me, EXP costs are almost tripled and Meneers run out faster. Well, I'm assuming the intention was to hurry the players along so they don't get as powerful as quickly, but combat isn't fundamentally harder in any way, so if you just build correctly, I don't see what's stopping you from eventually reaching that critical mass where you can safely solo tier threes and fours. <laughs> Especially so, because you get a huge power spike just from having a good weapon, which is a totally random occurrence, I might add. The only mechanically different thing is that it makes diplomacy slightly harder. Diplomacy is already fairly easy, so I really don't think it adds much, especially since there are items in the game that functionally nullify the handicap. Then there's the flip side, story mode, which is supposed to make the game easier, and to be fair, it does, since it scales difficulty for everything as if you had one less player, so manier lighting costs less, and harder encounters are gone. But, like challenge mode, it doesn't fundamentally affect the, you know, actual gameplay loop. There's nothing like doubling resource gain or increasing your base energy. You know, stuff that would actually speed the game up and get you into the story faster. So chances are, it'll still feel tedious if you're just looking for faster story progression. Plus, in story mode, you'll have access to harder encounters at a slower rate, which means less EXP. And less EXP means less access to skills that make the game easier in resource generation. So yeah, no thanks. And speaking of skills, these are super not balanced. Like. The difference between cards like Now or Never and Sneak Attack versus cards like our Fast Learner and Combat Instinct is insurmountable. You have to remember that anytime you're buying a skill, that's probably like four or five deck upgrades you could be doing. So Fast Learner is just, why? And Combat Instinct is literally never useful. Like if you have good cards, when are you ever holding onto them past hand limit and you know, not just playing them? Meanwhile, Now or Never and Sneak Attack basically both have the efficacy of playing an extra card out of thin air, with Now or Never literally drawing you an extra card and Sneak Attack doubling the damage of a card. Like, Jesus, these are strong. I really question why all skills don't have individually balanced EXP costs, because oh my god, their power levels are nowhere near each other. Skills also have the capability of nullifying your character's negative trait, which I'm not convinced is a good thing, because these negative aspects help to make the characters feel really unique in your adventures, as they all have these weird quirks you have to play around and they're honestly really memorable. Your characters already all start to blend together as you level up because suddenly no one's missing any key attributes and everyone can more or less get the job done in combat or diplomacy no problemo. The last bit of gameplay mechanics that we have gripes with is diplomacy in general. Diplomacy encounters are in a really weird spot in Tainted Grail. For one, they're generally a little too easy. That's kind of what's gonna happen when you only have to move upwards on a track like a handful of times to succeed. Two, they happen much less frequently than combat encounters. As a reminder, three of the random encounter decks are all combat and the only diplomacy one is the blue one. And then on top of all that, the blue deck has a ton of nothing happens cards. This makes diplomacy feel like a rather neglected aspect of Tainted Grail that's just there for some gameplay padding. The focus on random encounters is definitely on combat, and when leveling up you should mostly be improving your combat deck, and very rarely should you think about getting new diplomacy cards. On top of all that, there's a number of diplomacy encounters that, when failed, just become combat encounters. So you can just slaughter your way through everything without consequence if need be. So this begs the question, why is diplomacy even in the game? 
We feel like Tene Grail would legitimately play better if it was just entirely removed from the game. Especially because every single time you are randomly in a diplomatic situation, you know what you don't get to do? Actual dialogue and story moments. I want to see actual exploration journal options for when I talk myself out of getting framed again, instead of just seeing a mishmash of unimaginative diplomacy cards. The most egregious aspect of this is how there's sometimes diplomacy encounters built into the exploration journal. So, you know, instead of getting a blue card out, you play to the right of the book. Why? Why not just have actual dialogue? Okay, I, I get wanting to make the right side attributes of your character matter, but you could always just up the rate at which you find journal entries that require you to have X amount of whatever attribute. Or I don't know, just make the right side EXP costs less and just do something. The diplomacy problem also helps contribute to Tainted Grail's lack of deeply memorable characters. Everyone sort of just feels like esoteric plot points instead of actual living, breathing people. We're not expecting like Witcher 3 or Fallout New Vegas levels of character death and interpersonal drama or anything, but this issue does make us dislike diplomacy's inclusion even more. Okay, last bit of cons, I swear. On to exploration journal based cons, which thankfully are much more slight than all the mechanical gameplay cons, and also they're sometimes just affected by the mechanical cons. Like an example is how much I'm more scared of the exploration journal than I am the combat. When I'm out there casually slaying monsters like a badass, I feel goddamn invincible. But then I go exploring in a cave and I slip and fall because I had a bad caution dice roll, which makes me feel like a dumbass. I, I, I'm not kidding, that actually happened to me and feels really comedic and just how disconnected the experiences of different threats in this game feel. I am straight up relieved to see hard combat encounters and I am scared shitless at the prospect of taking direct damage from exploring. On that note, dice rolling when exploring, I'm not gonna harp on too much because, you know, it's dice rolling, but I will say that something about the numbers feels off. Oftentimes, you make a roll and then the journal tells you to add how much of an attribute you have to the roll, counting skills. Basically, there's too many times you need to get a five or a six, but if you have none or one of that attribute, ooh, that's gonna be rough, buddy. Some slight numbers tweaking here would be nice because early on, it feels like you're failing every other roll, and you always gotta be careful about RNG, cause it's not something the players can directly control, so it can be easily frustrating. Another gripe we found just as frustrating was how there's some exploration options that straight up just waste your time. And not like in a fun red herring way that gives you some insight into what you're actually supposed to be doing. I'm talking like weird dumb stuff, like climbing up a cliff and then, oh no, look, there's spooky weird mist, I take one horror damage. Like, what the hell? There was literally no indication. The option was just like, climb the cliff. Plus, the actual thing that happened to take damage was just lame. These are few and far between, but their existence kind of makes me feel like the writers were scrambling together to just quickly put some more padding in or something. This is because there's other actually cool time wasters, like walking into weirdness and having the journal spend the whole paragraph describing all the weird and trippy things that happens to you before you take damage. Stuff like that is cool and is definitely the proper way to satisfyingly write dead ends to explorations when you pick the bad option. It's really important to get stuff like this right because part of a good mystery is obfuscating what the good and bad options actually are. Especially so when there's options that will do a ton of damage to you. I haven't seen anything that outright kills you thankfully, but still that boatload of damage needs to be presented properly. You'd be surprised just how often you're not supposed to play carefully like a super careful survival person, but instead do the aggressively sketchy and stupid thing where you just touch the obviously dangerous relic and let the magic happen. So the less obvious the answer is, the less dangerous the consequences should be. This uncertainty of risk management when exploring could have also been managed better when it comes to options that ask you to pay certain amounts of resources like energy or wealth. There's a few times where the journal will prompt you to pay X amount of something, up to a cap. And you'd think that paying more would be better, but there's some times where the correct answer was to pay like two energy instead of four energy, which just feels really bad if not properly insinuated. Like, come on, the gameplay is already grindy enough by wasting time and resources while constantly ticking down Manir's dot, god fuck. We really don't need the journal to waste stuff too.
Which does make me wonder, what if the feeling of grindiness is something that's just a matter of presentation? Tainted Grail does this thing with some of its secrets where, once you learn them, the game doesn't actually give you the lore specifics. As an example, the goal of the very first chapter is to figure out how to obtain the secret that enables you to light Meneers in the first place. Obviously, we aren't going to spoil what you're supposed to do to get it and what happens afterwards, but we will point out that upon receiving the secret, you don't actually get any flavor text, you're just suddenly able to light Meneers. Like, maybe if every time you lit a Meneer, there was some cool flavor text about some, I don't know, ritual you perform, then it probably wouldn't feel as grindy. But at the moment, you literally just walk up to a Meneer and throw a bunch of crap at it, and then it just sort of lights up. I got my fingers crossed that this whole Meneer lighting thing gets elaborated as the game goes on, but man, it feels really uninspired at the moment to just pay a bunch of random resources without any descriptive fanfare. All right, nitpicks time. These aren't going to affect the actual scoring, but we still gotta mention them and then we're finally done with this giant list of cons. So first off, at the start of chapter one, Tainted Grail suggests that you explore your starting area and try to end the day there. If you do explore, there's two fairly reasonable options to take, but one of them gives you less stuff if you don't have one reputation, which only Ilay starts with. When I saw this, I restarted my campaign. Not too hard to do when, you know, it's the first turn. And I instead did the location action first, which just gives you reputations. So then, yeah, great advice, Tainted Grail. We also suggest reading all the characters' lore letters and not just yours before actually starting the game, because they give a much more complete picture of the starting premise, and you'll also probably be less confused when exploring the starting area and they start just name dropping. Okay, next nitpick, Tainted Grail does have this free companion app that's not mentioned anywhere in the rulebook that basically just gives you a second exploration journal. So it's not the most necessary thing, but it is nice if you want voiceovers and music. However, when the companion app lists your options for an exploration, it just lists the options and not any prerequisites you may need. So you have to tap the option and then the prompt shows up checking if you have the status or whatever. So yeah, that's a pretty annoying time waster not found in the normal exploration journal. Also, the UI sounds like Minecraft and it's really hard not to laugh at that. The last nitpick is that Ayla is insanely sexualized for not really any good reason. Like she's literally in her underwear. The women in the Temptations encounter are wearing more clothes than her, like, what? Hey, hello there, small orphan child. You know what would make you feel better? Smell my finger, and now I'm gonna sexy dance. Look, if you really want to design her to look like this, make it an actually meaningful part of her character. Like, if she was, I don't know, like an ex-priestess turned harlot, that's an interesting character hook. The game is a narrative-driven dark fantasy. You could do that. Let me just play as a badass forsaken witch hooker. And hilariously enough, her mentor in the story is actually a priestess, so let that sink in for a bit, because either the religious institutions of Avalon are insanely progressive, or someone had a horny gamer brain when designing ILA. This is one of those things that we as reviewers would be uh, remiss not to bring up, because yeah, while it doesn't affect our scoring, it's still something that at best annoys, or at worst turns away a pretty sizable number of players. Oh my god, finally we can talk about the recommender score part. Whew, shout out to all your homies out there who made it this far. As a reminder, this is where we actually try to critically evaluate the game by weighing the aforementioned pros and cons, and we are giving Tainted Grail the recommender score of a 6 out of 10, a above average experience. Wait, how does the game score that highly, considering that we just spent god knows how long totally just lambasting it in the cons? Let me tell you how. It's all because of this book right here. We cannot stress hard enough that this is ultimately the Tainted Grail experience. And it's really hard to talk about in any meaningful way without just spoiling stuff that happens. Like, I really want to talk about that time when, like, watching me. Or, like, when King. But I just can't say why any of those moments are cool. Like, just, God! Just, this whole review is an exercise in how to dance around the main selling point of the game while still trying to talk about it in depth. We can't show you any pages in the book, we can't set them out further, like, God damn it, dude. Anyway, here's where we stand on Tainted Grail. It's much more about the story and exploration than the actual game mechanisms. And if that's what a game wants to focus all its energy, then sure, 
All these gameplay and rules pitfalls just don't really hurt as much. Plus, it's not like the gameplay is completely unsalvageable. You can find so many BGG threads about house rules and how to make the game less grindy. And a plethora of other tweaks players have come up with to adjust the game to their liking. Which, I can't tell if it's genuinely because the story is that good and people wish the gameplay narrative didn't clash with it, or if it's from Kickstarter buyer's remorse. But I'll give the benefit of the doubt since, uh, I too enjoy the story significantly. And I definitely don't have any buyer's remorse. <laughs> Normally for our reviews, we tend to judge everything by rules as written, because when you start throwing in house rules, that's kind of cheating when trying to actually review the finished, actual game. But unlike with other games, Tainted Grail has so much more to offer than just its gameplay. In the official FAQ, there's even an entry saying that you really should just have someone at the table settle your rule disputes when they come up, which is a very Dungeons and Dragons-esque thing to be doing in a board game. If Tainted Grail is a game about story and exploration, then unfortunately the mechanics and rules failed to work in tandem with that goal by turning it into a survival over story experience, with the biggest mistakes being attributed to terrible balance, tons of distracting grinding, and way too many random meaningless fights. These problems kind of just all compound on each other to end up wasting a ton of time in total. It's also really bad pacing how Maneers can find you to a certain area, like if you were allowed to take a bunch of damage to go outside their range to light up a Maneer further out, I'd imagine most players would do that in a heartbeat. Just think about why most video game RPGs have a fast travel system, or like how in D&D, most DMs don't bother going into too much depth on travel and survival mechanics because they often don't make for good gameplay or roleplay stories. And if they do include it, it's usually for an isolated segment of the adventure instead of the entire thing. It kind of reminds me of that criticism you see of there being too many survival early access games on Steam that are realistic, sure, but they turn tedious very quickly. You know what? There's actually a lot of parallels to be drawn there. Tainted Grail really is like a good early access video game that's kind of broken and buggy, but not unplayable. Which is funny I say that because Awakened Realms have a digital side to them where they'll be releasing Tainted Grail off all of Avalon on Steam later this year. Though there is a roguelike version currently released that showcases their combat, which is completely different from the board games and is apparently pretty good based on these Steam reviews and a few random YouTube videos I watched. So here's our recommendation. If you look at all the promotional material like the art, and this game's dark fantasy lore really vibes with you, plus you want an interesting story that's propped up by a really unique and mysterious world, Tainted Grail is definitely worth checking out. However, if you're a hardcore, rules-as-written kind of person and or a try-hard min-maxing dickhead, uh, I am guilty of both, there's gonna be massive pitfalls in the gameplay that you will be endlessly annoyed by. Trust me when I say that you'll have much more fun with the game if you kinda just go with it. Focus on the story and don't feel bad about bending the rules here and there to suit your playing experience. I know that's a very unfair assessment for a ton of other board games that we reviewed, cause like, Tactically, every board game out there can be much better after some house rules. But this is different, because it's really a choose-your-own-adventure masquerading as a board game. So, to that end, use house rules, and don't feel bad about doing so. It's a rather unique experience, as you don't often get to play an epic choose-your-own-adventure with multiple people. There's just so much to appreciate about Tanya Grail's universe and story that, if you're into it, it's worth playing through the game's jank to experience it. You look at all the art and marketing, and there's just this intrigue about what the hell this game is even about. There's all this dark, edgy eye candy to look at, but then when you're actually playing, you're following dark, edgy breadcrumbs and making all these inferences about the world that just make the intrigue go even deeper. Like when I was playing, I was taking notes on so many random details just so I can constantly make inferences about the world that would end up influencing the decisions I made in exploration options. That and keeping tabs on side tasks and requirements for options that were blocked for me so I know when to come back to them. Oh, and that's another thing, we highly recommend taking notes while playing because there's going to be a lot to keep track of and this will be a huge time saver later on, like you're pretending to be a detective on a large-scale fantasy adventure. But then on the flip side, if you don't like the premise and or you want good gameplay mechanisms, look elsewhere. This island was never meant for you. Don't be like Arthur and take it anyways. Don't buy into the hype and blindly follow Tainted Grail's high ratings, especially since Tainted Grail isn't available for retail yet, if ever, meaning that there's gonna be a whole bunch of 10 out of 10s from Kickstarter backers with a vested interest already. So buyers beware, cause hype is weirdly infectious. Okay, personal score time. How do I personally feel about Tainted Grail, The Fall of Avalon? A, 
8 out of 10. I have a great time with this game. Okay, so initially, when I was first playing, shit was not good. I was feeling very 3 or 4 out of 10. Reading this rule book, front to back, gave me a very sour taste for all the time-wasty reasons addressed from cons. And on our first playthrough with three players, there was definitely a lot of jank and just hiccups going on. Then, me and Ashton decided to restart the campaign, except we did this weird thing where we both played chapter one solo, and when we reconvened for chapter two, we kind of just combined our two worlds. Thanks to doing that though, I got to a point where I was way more comfortable with the rules without worrying about holding up other players. This was also when my mindset was shifting more towards F the rules, just play the game. Which, when in tandem with having more story intrigue shot into my brain from chapter one, suddenly got me way more interested. Normally, I'm someone who feels really uncomfortable not playing rules as written because I get this weird feeling that I'm doing something incorrectly and not adhering to the designer's vision, because that's kind of what I'm playing board games for, rules and structure, and an already balanced package so I don't have to doodle things myself. If I want an unstructured, just whatever the hell, I go to Dungeons and Dragons. So yeah, we're playing, the game's actually moving along, we have a third dude randomly dropping in and out in the middle of chapters, and everything is feeling fresh and wondrous. We're constantly exchanging ideas and what ifs. The gameplay is new and exciting. There's just so many cool things to take in all at once. The first few chapters to me felt good. Things actually felt tense. I felt like I was out there surviving in this badass, unforgiving world, desperately looking for answers while carefully planning out how I'm gonna pay for food and manures. It felt awesome taking these calculated risks where we carefully choose what fights we wanted to take. Like, I remember feeling like a badass when we grouped up to kill this selkie that showed up and was threatening to block off an important route for us. Or the other time when a beast slayer randomly showed up and we saw that he dropped a random weapon. So we decided to take that difficult fight because none of us had items and what if weapons are really good? Oh, how naive we were. That weapon was the start of something really ugly. Suddenly, we were grinding for food. The tier three enemies seemed easier. We were getting EXP faster, picking up random skills, but you know, the actual gameplay was still pretty fun in between our exploration. Then after chapter three, Ashton said he was done and wanted to put his time to you know, other channel stuff, so I ended up soloing chapters four and five, and currently I'm mid chapter six, and holy crap, towards the latter end of chapter four, I started getting really overpowered. Then sometime in chapter five, I was really feeling the monotony of the grind when surviving because combat was way too frequent while feeling fairly samey. Enemies don't really have enough of a personality under this combat system and all kind of just feel the same. I really wish they were able to do more unique things because you can easily control everything that happens since they behave based on how damaged they are. Plus, their starting connection keys no longer matter the instant you play a card and just start comboing off off your own connections. Your only real threat is either running out of cards or not having the right card to play, and either way, those are both just a result of bad RNG or bad deck building. If you have a good, consistent deck that combos well, combat plays itself. Combine that with fighting on average like every other turn, and you can see how that just gets tedious. If I were designing this, I'd make combat radically different and more complex. I'm talking bigger hands, drawing more cards, more complex enemy behavior like their own attack deck, just something more crunchy. Obviously that takes longer, so fights would have to be more infrequent, but that's a good thing in my opinion. Your fights should feel like there's a story to them instead of just being run of the mill. But I think I've made it clear by now that combat isn't this game's strong suit. It's the story. and. Oh my god, I love all the stuff that's been going down. I want to know what's going to happen next so much that I'm putting up with the grind, and by putting up with it, I mean house ruling. Like, I'll just auto win encounters I don't feel like playing out and just randomly take damage if I feel like it. Though, I still need to settle on a Muneer house rule that I like. There's one that had Muneers lasting forever, but every time you needed to light a new one, you still pay all the resources and move a different Muneer to the new spot. I didn't like that one because it didn't feel good for traveling long distances, so I'm next looking into being able to pay half the cost to put a Muneer down with a one dial, and also one that just straight up lets you walk wherever you want, but you take two damage and terror when moving into locations not in range of a Muneer. Look, I ultimately really like Dark Fantasy, and Tainted Grail just has a really cool world that I want to learn more and more about. I have a great time just reading the exploration journal and playing Fantasy Detective, enough to the point 
that I'm willing to overlook all the mechanical faults and just have fun essentially playing a choose your own adventure that's barely even an actual board game the way I'm playing it. But hey, the FAQ says you should have a guy settle rules disputes. And you bet your ass I am disputing all the rules that I find unfun, which is almost everything. Hello, and welcome to Shelfside Book Reviews. Today, we're covering Tainted Grail. As Daniel said, I also did get to play this game. And my score for Tainted Weirdness, The Fall of Rule Books, is gonna be a seven out of 10. I have a good time with it. At first, I really had no idea what my score was going to be. The story certainly hooked me more than Gloomhaven, but there was so much confusion with the rules, I thought I was losing my mind. It doesn't help that I happen to get god-awful roles, pick a Rev, who is the guy who does really badly in the first chapter, and I was pretty tilted. The mechanics didn't grip me much either, so I was like, this is just eh. But then, this is where Daniel comes in, who I dubbed the Chronicler and gave full responsibility for handling these rules. So then, I could turn off my brain and just have fun. And have fun I did. I found myself really, really immersed on what Avalon has to offer. That is, after getting the laughter out of the way because the notion of a weird, dark Camelot has been kind of tainted by watching this movie so many times, probably like 10 times. Once I got those hard laughs out of the way, the deduction and discussion was great. Now I'm talking with my homies on how exactly to interpret the Arthurian legend and I can just feel the branching past opening up so many questions of the island. It was like, well, that character was good in King Arthur, but are they the good guys here? What even is a good guy on this island? Should we switch sides? The game keeps telling us we can. The island of Avalon, while not being huge as say Gloomhaven's world, has things that continually grab my attention when I think I've figured something out. It's like, Oh, we already got the item for that. It's gonna be super simple. And then we find a whole new side quest in an old location. Then I'm thinking about the backstory of a settlement's conflict. What are the implications on the map if we do help out a faction? Just great world building stuff. But what about the gameplay? Well, after a couple playthroughs under my belt, I feel like the mechanics after the rulebook finagling, which is really bad, is just passable. The combat was really cool at first, until it got grindy. The upgrades are also cool, until we found out they're busted. And then also, the items are cool, until you realize some of them are just way too strong. So the game certainly isn't balanced. And there's a hell of a lot of downtime when someone else is fighting. Straight up, Daniel and another friend were getting into combat while learning the game, and I just stepped out for a long while, I think it was like 15 minutes, for them to kill a single freaking bear. Now let's go back to the grind. See, I didn't play this game as nearly as long as Daniel. So I only had a bit of the forest hunting grocery store grind. I do suspect that as I play more of Tainted Grail, the grind further irritates me and then my score would go down. How far will it go? I can't really say for sure, but if the story keeps continuing to impress, I would say that six out of 10 is the lowest it will go. As Daniel pointed out, this right here, this is Tainted Grail. And the story of this game has continued to impress me at so many corners, keeping me interested on this island that you're trekking around. And I haven't felt this curious about a map in a board game ever. Do I wish it was more detailed and had more dialogue and more fleshed out quests? Yeah, of course. And to that regard, I'm very curious on what's next for board game epic RPGs. Tainted Grail is gonna go ahead and join this war of mine for being the current go-to flavor text heavy co-op story that isn't a detective game. And uh, God, I think that's it for me. It's, it's so hot in here, guys. I, I can feel the weirdness just affecting my brain. Just how the weirdness and the rule book of Tainted Grail has affected my brain. The fall of Robux. You know what I just realized? This what? review is strikingly similar to our Eldritch Horror review, which was like, 
there's all these random stupid faults in the gameplay and you can even argue this like a little bit grinding like you just do dumb stuff in between actually doing the main objective and on top of that both of them don't have near enough encounter variety but then for some reason I personally enjoy playing both of them I'm just willing to go out of my way to address their shortcomings just because I like their vibes so much but how are you not hot in here for it's very hot I'm very weird the tainted weirdness Whew. oh my god thank you all so much for making it to the end of this video you viewer yes you you are crazy I love it oh my god but also one more thing don't forget to like comment and subscribe and also don't forget to check out our patreon if you'd like to support us patreon.com slash shelf side because uh there's another thing we got in there an extended version of this review yeah our patrons get to watch even more tainted grail nonsense so I don't even know how many of them are actually gonna watch the whole thing. This is, this is really long. This is really long. Woo! And shout out to our patrons, Ashton Style. We got John S, Manuel G, Brian C, Clifford H, Aaron W, Max B, Barra, Jeremy M, C, Charlie P, Quinn S, Sam S, Travis R, Alvin Y, Vamsi K, Ryan D, Jennifer L, Brett M, Matt G, Peter Z, uh, Spinner71, Ryan J, uh, Brad G, Tiago Dot, Mark A, James M, Evan B, Charles B, Jr., Josh J, Basper, Rattle, Sophie, Reiner Z, Colin Allen, Hudson T, Pearson B, and the Mad Lance. We got Z, L, Jeff, L, uh, Tyler, R, A, me. And, oh my god, thank you guys so much for supporting the channel. And if you'd like to become a patron yourself, link's down in the description. Tyler said he wants his name on screen. So, I guess the point, I'll put his name there. Oh, that's what I mean. False promises into false promises into misdirection. Why? Because we're lying to him about religion.